All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this wonderful panel, Sound and the Politics of Assembly. My name is Alex Blue. I'm Assistant Professor of Black Studies in Media and Technology at McGill University, and I have just the distinct pleasure uh, of getting to fill in as chair for this panel. Uh, so I'm going to read everyone's bios for you in order, uh, then we'll have a series of papers. We're going to do all of the Q&A at the end. Uh, so first, we will have Matt Sakakini, who is Associate Professor of Music at Tulane University. He's the author of Roll With It, Brass Bands in the Streets of New Orleans, and he's the co-author of Keywords and Sound and Remaking New Orleans. Matt is a board member of the Roots of Music After School program and is writing a book about music education in New Orleans with photographer Abdul Aziz. Next, we will have artist, scholar, producer, Alex E. Chavez, who is the Nancy O'Neill Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Notre Dame, where he's also a faculty fellow of the Institute of Latino Studies. He is the author of the multi-award winning book, Sounds of Crossing, Music Migration and the Oral Poetics of Huapongo Arrebeño, uh, which is out on Duke University Press in 2017. Uh, and was the recipient of the Alan Miriam Prize from the Society for Ethnomusicology in 2018. Uh, Lee Vera Ragavan will be next. And Lee is the assistant, uh, sorry, visiting assistant professor in music at Tulane University. She's working on a monograph project called The Headlong Stream, doing sound research in the Anthropocene, which addresses the limits of social justice discourse in music studies when confronted with on the ground realities of mobilizing and extractivist development. And then finally, we will have Roshana Keshti, uh, assist, uh, sorry, Associate Professor of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies at UC Berkeley. She is the author of Modernity's Ear, Listening to Race and Gender in World Music, out on NYU Press in 2015 and switched on Bach, which is on Bloomsbury Academic, a uh, 33 and a third series in 2019. She's currently working on a book tentatively titled We See With the Skin, Zora Neale Hurston's Synesthetic Theory. Uh, I'm very excited to hear these papers, so let's go ahead and get right into it with Matt. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, um, Roshanak, for putting this together. Um, uh, this group is actually part of a special issue of American Anthropologists that will come out, I swear, sometime in our lifetimes. <laughs> but uh, it's been really great um, dialoguing with you all uh, over email and now uh, meeting in person. Um, and all that said, uh, I'm presenting on totally new material today. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sure it won't be messy at all. Um, and I, I'm trying to um, put, a, put some images and sounds together for you of this uh, uh, book project I'm working on with Abdul Aziz. And he's also a great um, photographer and videographer. So you'll see some of his um, beautiful uh, images here today. I'll go ahead and get started. Today I'm going to talk about the racial and gender politics of Mardi Gras parades, especially the role of school marching bands in New Orleans um, Mardi Gras is a fascinating example of assembly, usually thought of in terms of the carnivalesque, the inversion of power hierarchies, and flouting of social norms. But I'll start with the history of Mardi Gras as an explicitly white supremacist assembly, then ask why it was that black marching bands first integrated the parades in 1967, and end with a bit of ethnographic research about the maintenance of power hierarchies and social norms uh, at Mardi Gras today. While the origins of Carnival go back to the Lenten rituals of the city's French founders, the oldest parading organizations are a legacy of the Confederacy. The crews of Comus, Momus, Rex, and Proteus were founded right around the Civil War. In a classic study of New Orleans, um, Cities of the Dead by Joseph Roach, he showed how the exclusive meetings and invitation-only balls of these organizations served as something of a social wing for the Democratic Party, which had violently usurped power from the multiracial Republican Party by 1876, which was also when the Crescent City White League essentially became the state militia. Uh, these politicians and businessmen named streets and schools after Confederates 
while their wives and daughters oversaw the construction of memorials that marked the built environment as openly white supremacist. And you might know about that because the monument removal movement really started in New Orleans uh, in the mid-2010s. The iconic parades featuring masked riders tossing throws off of gaudy floats were then another type of civic project, spelling out the racial conditions of possibility on the very streets of the city. A black crew called the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club began marching on Carnival Day in 1909, but it is the King of Rex who presides over all New Orleanians, referred to as his subjects on Carnival Day. Like all of the old line Mardi Gras crews, membership in Rex was closed to blacks, Jews, Italians, and other ethnics until 1991, 1991, just to repeat that, when the city council forced all crews to integrate or dissolve. Um, by the way, uh, one or two of them just shuddered at that point um, rather than do token integration, which is what the other two did. Um, the process of desegregation had been put in motion a few decades earlier at the height of the civil rights era when the crew of Rex invited the St. Augustine marching band to join their 1967 parade. So I'm skipping around historically, but I think focusing from, from this point on uh, for the rest of the talk. The name was borrowed from the legendary Marching 100 of the Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, or FAMU, which, which really kind of kicked off this uh, uh, Southern show style black marching band tradition that has become so um, illustrative of, um, of blackness and Southernness uh, uh, recently. At football games, the sound and swagger of these bands came to eclipse the actual game and they've appeared in everything from Outkast's 1998 video for Rosa Parks to the Ying Yang Twins' 2004 hit Halftime, Stand Up and Get Crunk, to Beyonce's memorial documentary, Homecoming. In New Orleans, the sounds and images of hundreds of black students blasting hip hop tunes and throwback tunes have become an indelible icon of Mardi Gras festivities. And none is more iconic than this band, the St. Augustine uh, High School uh, Marching 100. The choice to include St. Og in the 1967 Rex Parade on Mardi Gras Day was part of the broader political imperative for forced integration. Founded in 1951 by Josephite priests and brothers, St. Augustine is the only all-black, all-boys Catholic school in the US. In the civil rights era, the figure of, of what's called the St. Og Man became a fixture on the front lines of desegregation. And graduates include the city's first two black mayors, Dutch Morial, 1978, if you're keeping track of, of New Orleans' supposed progressivism in the South, 1978 was our first citywide um, black politician, and Sidney Bartholomew right after that in 86. Uh, and numerous other politicians, doctors, lawyers, businessmen, military officers, and professional football players. The school advances a politics of respectability tailored specifically for black boys to excel in a structure of white dominance. And from the first year St. Og was founded, uh, this man here in the middle, legendary band director Edwin Hampton, uh, who everyone calls Hamp, oversaw the critical role of band in forming disciplined young men while also drawing upon the allure of black music and culture to break through racial lines. So Hamp was a military veteran and a graduate of Xavier University, which is the only um, uh, Catholic HBCU, uh, where he studied uh, classical music. And before his, uh, uh, his retirement, he explained, quote, the music we tried to play with the same attention, which we would have in playing a major symphony. And since we had all boys, I thought we could take the root of military discipline and military movement and maneuvers. I tried to combine those two elements. And, and this is a, a, a documentary about the band um, from the 90s called Bended Knees. And, and this is one of the alumni from, from that early period explaining this, this militarism, the, the, what, what they feel is the attraction for young men of the militarism. And we recognize in there that there was, a, there was something endearing about uh, military discipline. So we tried to instill this in the kids. Uh, a marching band is, is, is really is a takeoff from the military unit. So we wanted that 
aspect to be a, a major part of our playing. After all, playing music has a lot of, it requires a lot of discipline in itself. But the marching aspect of it was just an, an extension of that whole thing. I, I would give this to uh, the credit here to Hampton, Hampton himself, totally, because he wanted a pre precision military type of operation. And that's what he got. Uh, uh, that's what St. Augustine became known for. When St. Augustine band came marching down the street, everybody took notice. So in 1967, after St. Aug won a state lawsuit to gain admission into the all-white Louisiana High School Athletic Association, the band's meticulous uh, halftime shows, which you just saw there, with these perfectly aligned rows of bended knees, which is where the name of the documentary comes from, were unveiled to white opponents. Uh, that was the same year uh, St. Aug joined uh, dozens of white bands, as I mentioned, in the crew of Rex Parade, uh, marching through the tightly packed French Quarter on Mardi Gras Day, spectators spat through bottles, uh, poured urine from balconies down onto the band, and Hamp had instructed the boys to just look straight ahead without reaction, and that's just what they did. So on this sort of front lines of struggle against uh, white supremacy, not only in politics, but in sport, music, even Mardi Gras, St. Og men kind of mounted this offensive of, of black excellence, and this was not a path of revolutionary insurrection and, and, and all the discourse today of the, of the black radical tradition. I think it would be hard to slot this into that. This is much more of the, um, you know, the Booker T. Washington wing of steely-eyed accommodationism, the cultivating a disciplined band of, of musical brotherhood that's really demanding inclusion and not transformation, right? Show style bands came to rule the streets uh, during Mardi Gras. The, the bands that, that I'm gonna turn to now um, stretched for a full block with the color guard, the drum majors, the majorettes, the flag team, the cheerleaders, followed by the musicians, usually trombones in front, mellophones, trumpets, woodwinds, tubas, and then the big drum section in the back, and then uh, often a dance team behind. Um, uh, high schools like Landry Walker, Edna Carr, and Warren Easton regularly battle St. Og but the Marching 100 is still known as, as the best band in the land. Uh, when Pope John Paul II arrived at the New Orleans airport in 1987, uh, the Archdiocese sent uh, the Marching 100 to greet him. They've performed for eight U.S. presidents in uh, five Super Bowls. Uh, in the wake of Title IX legislation, which, which essentially was a, a, a platform for gender integration, in, in, including in marching bands, um, it's telling that the only all boys, all black band in the city remains the standard bearer. The St. Og man is a model of bodily control and behavioral discipline combining respectability with, with militarism but also showmanship. Uh, the band I'm studying, um, which I forgot to put a slide in, but I'm, if you give me one second I'll try to. called The Roots of Music, there we go. And um, that they, they proudly accept the title, The Little St. Og. Here's a little clip of them playing in Mardi Gras Parade. Uh, actually, I'm favorite moments of Mardi Gras when the families see their kids come marching down the street and they all come out. Um, I wanna, uh, we're just gonna hear from two graduates or alumni of the Roots of Music program. Um, this is LeBron Joseph who, who went on to be the drum major for St. Og. And then he went on to Southern University, then Baton Rouge where the Marching 100, I'm sorry, the Human Jukebox is you know, considered one of the best bands in the South though. Those are fighting words. Um, so this is a clip of LeBron telling me about the, 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 the topic of um, militarism that I introduced a minute ago. 
the guys who structured these marching bands, like Dr. Isaac Greggs and uh, Mr. Ham from St. Aug and stuff like that, the people who actually put that culture in place for marching bands and stuff like that, they were in the military. So the way that they're intense in the military, the way that they talk to you in the military, all of that kind of carries over into the band world. And what that does is it shapes you to be able to put that much air in the horn, that much pressure behind your horn, and able to produce that type of sound. Whereas we have like classical musicians or like jazz musicians or like, you know, you don't need that type of mental state to do those things. But when you build in this marching band and you want to be monstrous and you want to be big and you want everybody to have this big old type attitude and vibe with them, mm -hmm. there's certain things you have to tell them, there's certain ways you have to act. It's, you have to get out there in the sun and do push-ups. You have to scream at them to the top of your lungs. You know what I mean? It's all a part of the culture, but it's all out of love because everyone wants to be the best. The roots of music in most high school bands and colleges are, are of course mixed gender bands. And the ideals of toughness, discipline, and competition that govern the band world impact women and girls very differently. Um, Hypermilitarism is also hypermasculinity, evident in how girls appear with matching helmets, gloves, boots, spats, even hairstyles usually have to, to go under the helmet, generally no visible jewelry or makeup or piercings allowed. Uh, it's also evident in where girls appear in band, um, always, of course, dominating the dance team and as majorettes, uh, very occasionally with, with queer-identified boys, and then concentrated in the woodwinds um, with some integration in upper brass and far less in the lower brass and percussion sections even though usually um, uh, those are uh, integrated. When Asia Mallory started at the Roots of Music, she was assigned the clarinet, but she resisted uh, telling her teachers, quote, I don't want to play this no more. I don't feel comfortable with this. This isn't me. And she switched to mellophone, um, part of the lower brass family, and quickly rose to um, section leader at Roots of Music, and then actually went on to become the first female section leader in the history of the Southern University Human Jukebox Band, where she just graduated last year when uh, Aziz took this beautiful picture of Asia. Um, drawing on Sherry Tucker's analysis of how instruments are gendered, Asia's switch to the mellophone should be understood as an inversion of expected norms. Um, I asked Asia what, what drives her to excel, and, and this is a, a clip from an interview from her. As a woman, the first woman assistant sexually that's Southern, you have to stay motivated. You have to have a support system. And it's almost like the, it's always a male-dominated industry. But once a female get in there, they think they better than you because they're males and they're bigger than you. But yeah. then again, it's all a mind game. You have to stay straight on the straight path to be the best. What do you have? What do you, what, what do you have to be like as a woman to succeed in that world? Well, hmm, that's a tough question. To succeed in that world, of course, you have to have positive thoughts, hmm. and you'll need a group of girls to have each other back in this situation, hmm. and you have to not get comfortable but you always have to be on guard for whatever comes your way. Mm. Later, Asia redirected our conversation away from criticizing her male counterparts and towards what's required to become a leader among them. So while band presents itself as a meritocracy, it's in actuality, of course, women must not only play by the rules of masculinity, but do better than men uh, without protest or even acknowledgement, typically, of its uh, patriarchal design, you know, which, which Asia is saying, then she, uh, she, she relies upon other women in the band to have those conversations. This is something both um, Beyonce and Lizzo are pushing back against in their recent videos, which pair them with HBCU bands. Uh, Lizzo's great, uh, good as hell with uh, Southern University. I think actually Asia's in this video. Uh, and then um, Beyonce's Homecoming, which was a, 
uh, 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 pieced together um, very large marching band. A different but related point from this analysis of gender roles is how the norms perpetuated in band dovetail with the racial ideologies kids face in school. Recent ethnographies by Savannah Shange and Damien Sojoiner assess public education as an institution meant to control dissent of racialized students through what they call ideologies of enclosure, linking schools to prisons, in, in their mind, not, not on a pipeline, but literal, that the school itself is modeled after a, a type of enclosure. This is especially true at charter schools with heightened disciplinary and security measures that predominate in New Orleans, which is the nation's only 100% uh, charter system. Kids must stand silently with heads down in hallways, clap at assemblies, pick up and put down pencils on command, and make eye contact with teachers or face detention. While arts education has been shown to improve students' social and emotional well-being, there's a surprising convergence between marching bands and charter schools and the emphasis on resilience, or what um, in education parlance is called grit, a famous book by Angela Duckworth, um, who, depending on which corner of ASA you sit in, is, is an angel or a devil. Um, in No Excuses schools, uh, grit is promoted as a character trait for students of color presumed to be deficient in controlling their behaviors. Oh shoot, I just outed which corner I'm in. Um, band allows administrators to extend their emphasis on grit into the extracurricular domain of arts instruction. So the shared emphasis on grit is one reason why band is actually increasing uh, presence at so-called uh, apartheid schools with over 95% black students. In other words, over the 15 years I've done my research, I expected that arts education would get further marginalized than it has, but there's actually been an increase in band. Um, schools also recognize band as a recruitment tool on the education marketplace, so schools in, in New Orleans um, get a check of, of $4,100 for every but in a chair, so there's, it, it's a literal capitalist system to educate children in the city. Um, and, and the bands, like as you see on KIPS, um, which, is, which is the largest charter network in the country, I think, um, using marching band as a way to recruit uh, parents and students. Mardi Gras parades then serve a promotional purpose of putting schools on display through the uniforms, banners, uh, brass instruments, and other shiny things and the earth-shaking sounds that signify black excellence. Like sports, music is an arena historically recognized for black mastery, and participation in band is a place of reverence and point of pride, as the Beyonce and Lizzo examples show. Discipline is critical to the widespread adulation of black bands, I've been arguing, because public performances meet expectations of properly disciplined blackness, not docile but gritty virile, but never wild or wilding. Just compare images of kids playing instruments and wearing band uniforms celebrated in media accounts against the stereotype of the hoodie invoked in uh, the, the, the killing of Trayvon Martin. Black marching bands operate within a highly circumscribed and contradictory space where young people perform blackness for admiring spectators and crew members. This is the space that's available to them, their performing bodies, perhaps their most lucrative form of cultural capital. And within these limitations, the band members present themselves as creative and disciplined young people. There's much to celebrate here while also acknowledging how Mardi Gras is a public assembly and spectacle that supposedly offers uh, the carnivalesque potential to invert power relations, also works to uh, enforce conformity to social norms and expectations of acceptable blackness. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's always great to see what my colleagues are are up to in terms of you know what they're thinking about because uh, it you know helps me sort of continue to imagine the things I'm trying to do and ask and all the rest. So, uh, quick prefatory note: this is uh, part of an ongoing book project based in the city of Chicago. Uh, a lot of case studies in terms of sound and largely sound in Latinx Chicago. And so this is one a particular case study that um, 
I'm centering around this notion of el disco es cultura. Um, the vinyl record is culture. Is, so. uh, in music production, a sonic artifact refers to sonic material that is accidental or unwanted, typically the result of the mani manipulation of sound within the editing process. Uh, this may be a cause of compression or unintended alteration in the case of digital recordings, both of which may produce noticeable distortion, among other phenomena. Yet in certain contexts, sonic artifacts are deliberately produced for creative reasons and stylistic experimentation, as is the case in sampling or in noise music. The latter typically incorporates an amalgam of sonic artifacts within the musical context in ways that challenge standard music-making practices. Nevertheless, this conventional understanding connotes both physical and figurative meanings, artifact as audible material alteration and artifact as subjectively defined auditory disturbance. Taken in tandem, both meanings attune the act of listening to error, to noise, the perception and definition of which relies on normative processes of decipherability. And so I take up the sonic artifact as an aesthetic figure or envelope with which to listen to Latinx Chicago. Yet I do so with attention to vinyl records or discos as literal material artifacts and ask, how do these schools broadcast in embodied and symbolic ways the racialized politics of urban territory and in turn come to amplify forms of spatial entitlement? Now to kind of step back a little bit, sound uh, stimulates an auditory imagining in search of its source, orienting one's listening accordingly. Thus, you know, aural attunement also involves, however, a wide range of non-auditory dispositions linked to broader engagements embedded within formations of power. In other words, that tuning in is comprised of culturally and historically situated modes of attention that operate as sources of knowledge intent on, yes, uh, yielding sonic focus and intelligibility, but perhaps most critically, rendering the source of sound decipherable in accordance with normative conceptions of rationality. So tuning in as a rationalizing exercise gives rise to what Nina Sun Edshim refers to as the acousmatic question. Who is this, is the question. Uh, in the race of sound, listening to uh, timbre and vocality in African American music, Edshim writes, quote, the acousmatic situation arises from the assumption that voice and sound are of an a priori stable nature. This position is grounded in truth claims about the voice as a cue to interiority, essence, and unmediated identity, end quote. And yet the voice, quote, is not situated at a unified locus that can be unilaterally identified, end quote. This is to say that anatomies of othering, or that take place within this context through listening, they are dynamic. They are experienced intersubjectively through adjacent queries that amplify the acousmatic question. For instance, not just who is this, but where are you from? In looking like a language, sounding like a race, racial linguistic ideologies, and the learning of Latinidad, Jonathan Rosa explores the contemporary formation of US Latinidad through the racialization of language. The US imaginary, he asserts, relies on space-time narratives that yield the two-part question commonly posed to countless persons who are racialized as non-white. Where are you from? No, where are you really from? These questions reveal how one's, quote, racially overdetermined body primordially anchored in an imagined foreign elsewhere demands to be accounted for, uh, end quote. So the where in these questions also directs our attention to the literal materiality of space and the cultural constructions of place therein, opening up the possibility of amplifying the acousmatic question and situation to consider how the cascading set of relationships between identity, placemaking, sound, and materiality come together and in this case in urban space, but with more specificity in Chicago. On Thursday, July 12, 1979, over 70,000 people converge at Comiskey Park, otherwise known as a White Sox Stadium, located in the Bridgeport neighborhood on Chicago's south side for a doubleheader between the Chicago White Sox and the Detroit Tigers. The stadium was filled beyond capacity, yet most of these spectators were not there to watch baseball. They were gathered to witness the planned destruction of thousands of disco vinyl records during the intermission between games. The evening was billed as Disco Demolition Night and was organized by Chicago radio uh, rock disc jockey Steve Dahl, who frequently ra uh, railed uh, against disco music on the airwaves. And this is him. 
In the weeks prior to the games, Dahl invited his listeners to bring disco records with them to the stadium to watch them be blown up. Of those who attended the game, over 10,000 de deposited vinyl records at the turnstiles. In total, an estimated 55,000 people filled the stadium, while another 15,000 gathered around Comis uh, Comiskey Park, and 10,000 were stuck in traffic on the Dan Ryan Expressway. Inside the stadium, the energy was manic as dozens of homemade banners, like the one you saw before, emblazoned with slogans like Disco Sucks, hung from the balconies, while the near all-white crowd shouted anti-disco chants. Now, just two years prior, the music business was poised to have its most commercially successful year, and the disco genre was why. And it seems for Dahl and the overflowing crowd at Comiskey Park, disco's music, uh, disco music's cultural ascendance felt like a threat. Right, quote, and this is um, Sam Reynolds, disco was rootless, inauthentic, decadent, a betrayal of the virile, uh, virile principles of the true American folk, music, rock and roll, end quote. Uh, briefly, the disco music genre emerges in the urban night, uh, life scene in New York's gay, black, and Latinx dance clubs in the 1970s. Uh, and in describing disco's uh, subversive, subversive sociability, uh, Simon Frith writes, quote, the driving force of the New York underground dance scene in which disco was forged was not simply the city's complex ethnic and sexual culture, but also a 1960s notion of community, pleasure, and generosity. What this involved in turn was not just utopianism, an individualistic uh, liberation uh, from cultural and sexual morals, but also a kind of selfness, a dream of bodily dissolution, end quote. This progressive social aesthetic rooted in non-heteronormative and black and Latinx subcultures was heard as noise, and thus met with deafening sounds of white grievance at Comiskey Park. The evening devolved into an all-out white riot as attendees rushed to the field after Dolls de uh, detonated a mountain of disco vinyl records. In the ensuing fallout, news and media outlets around the country proclaimed that Dolls' pyrotechnics marked the death of disco. However, in the wake of this incident, disco music would be reinvented as young Chicago DJs and music producers would take those same vinyl disco records and layer their melodic hooks and rhythmic pulses with rolling drum machines, 808 synthesizers, and powerful diva vocal samples to produce house music. Legendary house music DJ Frankie Knuckles would refer to, the house, uh, to house music as disco's revenge. Uh, Simon Reynolds elaborates, Quote, House didn't uh, just res uh, resurrect disco, it mutated the form, intensifying the very aspects of the music that most offended white rockers. The mechanic repetition, the synthetic and electronic textures, the hypersexuality, end quote. Resident weekend DJs like the Hot Mix 5 on Chicago's FM radio station, WBMX, helped popularize the genre in Chicago and eventually across music formats, right, tapes to CDs, the digital revolution, MP3s, and most recently online streaming, like Spotify. All attempts by the music industry to reduce the size or altogether eliminate the physical sonic artifact, increase access to the volume of music, and improve audio quality. While the latter is debatable, it is the case that contemporary music consumption does not necessarily require the listener to engage with the material sonic artifact, right, a tape, a CD, vinyl record, or otherwise, and yet, while merely 15 years ago, vinyl was almost on the verge of becoming an obsolete form, accounting for less than 2% of physical albums, according to the 2021 MRC data uh, year-end report, which is presented also in collaboration with Billboard, uh, vinyl is now the most popular physical format for the first time ever uh, uh, since the SoundScan era in 1991. In fact, vinyl's growth in 2021 uh, was so rapid that sales surpassed 2020's full-year volume by late September. Uh, Luis Gerardo Salas, legendary radio DJ and founder of Rock 101 in Mexico City, elaborates on vinyl's sonic quality. This is a translation. The vibration that is being generated in the groove, the actual groove, acquires a series of audio waves, especially in mids and lows and very high level trebles that you do not hear and is lost in digital compression. So those people from previous years advocated for vinyl to be rescued, to rescue the quality of the music as it should be heard. And then this revival begins with the vinyl object, end quote. Now these sentiments are captured in the slogan used by many self-proclaimed vinyl heads, vinyl crate diggers, and Latin American music audiophiles. El disco es cultura. The vinyl record is culture. A slogan originally stamped on Latin American releases of decades past, this promotional language has come to characterize a particular aesthetic a kind of sonics and value of the subculture, which is trans-hemispheric in reach. So there's a bit of an ethnographic moment that sort of brings us together in the context of Chicago. 
This is the Sonorama Collective Vintage Latin Sounds, Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, Guatemala, announces Carlos Charlie Garcia in his soft, muted voice as he spins vinyl records to the 800-plus crowd at the Double Door Live Music Venue located in the Wicker Park neighborhood on Chicago's north side. The energy in the club is at a fever pitch. It's midnight bodies upon bodies balanced to the galloping cumbia, guido shuffle, and conga upbeat, all part of a well-curated all-vinyl DJ set courtesy of Garcia. Originally from Mexico City, Carlos uh, Garcia, Charlie Garcia, migrated to the U.S. in the late 1990s, 90s, and he arrived in Chicago and established himself as an audiovisual artist, cultural organizer, has done extensive work with independent radio and fashion, himself a sound selector and music curator, interested in tracing the sonic roots and routes that connect Latin America to Chicago. And tonight, the scent of hardproof liquor, perfume, and the occasional trace of weed are making it pretty swampy in here, though it's about 10 degrees outside. But in here, it's steamy, and especially so if you're packed even below in the basement level where uh, Rebel Betty Martin has set up shop. She's spinning a slow, syrupy cumbia layered with a subtle garage organ while pentatonic psychedelic surf guitar melody lines soar above the rhythm. Martin is a Puerto Rican multidisciplinary artist, educator, sound selector, and activist working across the city of Chicago, and tonight she's spinning a long set consisting mainly of pan Latin cumbia and boogaloo at the monthly cumbia sasso happening. That's the picture that you saw. Founded by David uh, Itzinala, a DJ, MC Tiff Love, and DJ VJ Calixta Cumbia Sasso is, as they describe, quote, a DIO, do-it-ourselves party that brings together various DJs, bands, and visual artists for a night of dancing and surprises. The theme is broad, broadly that of being future-rooted or of looking back while looking forward and offers something unique for a generation of partygoers who want to honor their immigrant roots while forging some kind of new identity in the process, end quote. The Cumbia Sasso crew has organized happenings in activist lofts, machine shops, warehouses, and finally took up residence at the Double Door Music Venue. Musically, although they do make use of new technologies to create rave-spirited uh, mixing that centers around vintage sounds, quote-unquote, their ethos rebukes ready-made musical notions such as world. And this explains why they chose to name their gathering after the pan-Latin American musical tradition of cumbia, which originates among Afro-descendant communities in Colombia but is spread throughout the hemisphere from Argentina to the United States. Now, each Cumbia Sasso gathering features live bands, DJs, live visual artists, and raises funds for grassroots organizations dedicated to issues of social justice in and beyond Chicago. Um, Chicago-based salsa musician Henry has performed at the Cumbia Sasso happenings many a time and describes its latest iteration at the Double Door like this, quote, you still find pockets of resistance in the neighborhood. The lone tire shop or the bodega, and what happens over there at the Double Door on Saturday nights is an echo of what this neighborhood sounded like 30 years ago." End quote. Henry's Puerto Rican and his family arrived in the city in the 1950s in the wake of Operation Bootstrap in Puerto Rico. He grew up in Wicker Park and Bucktown, uh, neighborhoods that have witnessed gentrification for the last 25 years, and his history and politics are not lost on the Cumbia Sasso organizers. Before, their parties were nomadic and clandestine, but when they first decided to come above ground, they held their inaugural show at Talia Hall in the Pilsen neighborhood, they say. It was a difficult decision, actually. On the one hand, it has a 1,200-person capacity. Talia Hall is a space in the city that could accommodate the rising popularity of the party where there are so few affordable options. It's also in our dear Pilsen neighborhood where many of our organizers live and play. So it's home and makes sense. However, with its reopening in the context of a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood, I think everyone is wondering what is going to come out of its reintroduction on 18th Street. Undoubtedly, the space is, is mysterious and beautiful and will bring in some internationally renowned talent to Pilsen's doorsteps, which can be good, but no one knows what it will look like exactly." End quote. This uncertainty is felt by many of the places these artists perform at for largely Latinx audiences. It is a feeling central to the social aesthetic at play, a precarious sense of one's place in the city as people of color, as migrants, and disposable subjects, a structure of feeling that plays itself out in the agentive interplay between expressive resources that help create the social space of the dance floor, the disco, or the party with a purpose. And vinyl records, it seems to me, discos are at the center of the sounded social space. This is an adjacent party that people put on uh, to kind of celebrate disco demolition, but in a different way. 
Within the context, the term disco signifies something quite different than what it did for those who rioted at Comiskey Park in July of 19, uh, 1977, uh, or 79, excuse me. Uh, and as we see about the 70s sort of history here of disco music, that the genre emerged in queer, black, and Latinx social spaces centered around dance and music making that would later acquire a distinguishable sound. Yet the spatial gathering was indispensable to the genesis of this music. That disco in Spanish bears this connotation as well. It's a reference to both vinyl, sonic artifact, as well as a social space. Thus, while the disgruntled crowd at Comiskey Park took out their frustration on a mountain of vinyl records, what they objected to, in truth, were the communities and social spaces the sounds of disco represented. In all of its manifestations, disco represented noise, right? Disco as genre was not music. Disco as a sonic artifact was refuse. And disco as social space was a threat. Nested in the palimpsestral overlay of these aesthetic contexts, from the black arts movement in neighboring Bronzeville, just next to Bridgeport, or to contemporary Latinx vinyl DJs in that very neighborhood today, to the legacies of chess records, right, and house music. That disco demolition night reveals how space, sound, race, and material culture come together in unexpected ways, and in these very extraordinary moments uh, that sort of configure what uh, Ana Maria Ochoa calls the aural public sphere, yielding powerful moments of congregation. So from a white riot, to partying with a purpose, right, in Cumbia Sasu. Now, a broad scope of anthropological scholarship aids in apprehending this nexus between sound, space, politics. My colleague here, Matt Sakaki, in his work on New Orleans soundscapes, traces how the relation between sound and space uh, reveals a history of urban policies that have marginalized African Americans and how, in turn, that experience has shaped black cultural soundings in public space as important forms for communication. That the interpretation of these public soundings, however, quote, he writes, is dependent on an orientation towards sound in terms of both physical proximity, near or far, loud or soft, and evaluative listening, music or noise, pleasurable or intrusive, end quote, which in turn are shaped by culture, history, and personal experience. Similarly, in Sound Politics in Sao Paulo, uh, Leo Cardoso examines the structures through which sound and sonic events in urban space are differentially interpreted as noise upon entering debates concerning crime, public policy, segregation, etc. And Dave Novak and Maria Abe extend these concerns to social activism with a focus on the political role and interpretive power of sound in anti-nuclear protests and festivals in Japan. In particular, they explore how the sonics of grassroots action and performance generate an intertextual field of political discourse in post-311 Japan that, quote, frames political participation as a networked, um, networked improvisation that extends across multiple spaces of social identification rather than a ready-made singular voice, end quote. So to, to think with that thought, to begin to sort of uh, conclude here, that social processes sh shaping the dynamics of difference-making, operative, and constructing Latinxes within the US racial formation are continuously reproduced, and they too are transformed in everyday contexts such that Latinx ought not be understood as a ready-defined category, but rather as constituted by sets of cultural practices in use and in space and in tension, right? And the city of neighborhoods, right, Chicago, the circulation of sonic artifacts in this case, vinyl records, stigmatized musical genres in particular, occurs within social fields of power codified in urban spatial arrangements. And the rallying cry of El Disco es Cultura among Latinx creatives amplifies both an aesthetic ethos and material practice that lays claim to neighborhood histories and racial geographies of austerity from below. It's, they're sounding out what Chicago's romantic cultural poetics about itself often silences, right? All of which yields the following question. How are the grassroots experiences of music, sound, made political, and what are the outcomes of these politics? I think El Disco's Cultura provides one potential answer, or at least approaches this, right? Because as a curatorial practice, um, it represents a phonoesthetic assemblage of sounds that avail sonorous objects and auditory experiences as layered, thus pointing us towards a politics of sound that imagines citizenship in the city beyond state-sanctioned political rights and instead privileges placemaking aesthetics as a way of wielding a meaningful voice in the public arena, particularly in the face of certain forms of dispossession, which have conditioned particular ways of tuning into Latinx bodies, sounds, and culture in Chicago, amplifying them as unruly disturbances in order to justify their silencing, to continue the sonic metaphor, or their very removal. So to conclude, 
As Latinx neighborhoods transition into white spaces within the context of gentrification and are thus emptied out of their vernacular sonic pasts, the Latinx artists in question are placing material culture at the center of a recuperative practice of sonic reclamation operative along temporal and spatial axes. Vinyl records that feature vintage Latin sounds, to quote Carlos Charlie Garcia, broadcast the historical presence of Latinxes across the oral public sphere. The vinyl records in question as both material sonis, uh, sonorous objects and auditory disturbances index the historical presence of Latino America in Chicago right, as a multi-ethnic coalition. These DJs and sound selectors are curating a trans-hemispheric sonic cultural space that refuses the flattening singularity of what Leo Chavez calls the Latino threat. Right? The cultural capital and genealogy of histories of recontextualization that make current trends of sonic transculturation on the dance floor possible form an expressive grammar of Latinx subjectivities formed within the politics of displacement. Right? From forced migration out of Latin America to Chicago, to experiences of gentrification and displacement within the city itself. So to return to Nina Ed, uh, Nina Sun uh, Ed Shim, this sound culture disturbs the acousmatic question, who is this, by tuning into and amplifying the adjacent, where from, by bringing Chicago into the space of Latino America and vice versa. This is to say that Chicago is part of Latin America. And sound is an aesthetic and expressive vehicle because it uniquely, is uniquely capable of encompassing multiple, sometimes opposing subject positions critical to this production of locality. In other words, transcultural subjectivities and trans-hemispheric connections at play, they happen in space, and in the present context, they're made possible by a way of sonic artifacts that sound out imagined, localized, and complex co collectivities in the making, or a Latinx Chicago that's in the offing amid the racialized geographies of urban space. Thank you. Um, can you guys hear me? That's good. Um, all right, thank you for being here. Um, this is sort of new mater newish material for me too. Um, I think uh, in particular it's kind of, I feel that it's experimental with, um, with the sort of style in which I would normally present. This is a bit more, I guess, testimonial. Um, so I'd love any feedback on that um, at the end if you'd like to give it. Oh. So there is a sound that I have in mind. It's actually in here. I've been trying to figure out what to do with it since 2015. Uh, and between then and now, uh, the port somehow got smashed, which feels like an apt metaphor. Um, the reason I keep returning to the sound is that it isn't a sound. Uh, the recording in question picks up many sounds, but the eventful ones, the ones associated with the image that's, or the images that are seared in my memory just aren't there. I made this recording at a gathering that had features of a protest, an occupation, and a riot in November of 2014. The Kinder Morgan Oil Company had scheduled survey work in advance of twinning the already existing Trans Mountain oil pipeline that connects the Athabasca tar sands to the port of Burnaby, just east of Vancouver in British Columbia. This took place prior to the project's approval, uh, and there was, and still is, significant opposition to the expansion project, even though it was purchased by Justin Trudeau's federal government so that the development wouldn't need to secure private investors to proceed. To flow through the pipelines, bitumen mined in the tar sands needs to be diluted into a toxic slurry. A spill would be ecologically devastating, even without taking greenhouse gas emissions into account. In response to the survey work, an encampment sprang up, inspired by indigenous-led reoccupations of unceded traditional land around the province. The occupiers, in this case, were mostly settlers, and they camped out in a municipal park on Burnaby Mountain, just below the campus of Simon Fraser University. Whenever survey workers were spotted, the occupiers would peacefully, if rudely, tell the workers to leave because their work would harm the park's ecosystem, and the project was opposed by the local indigenous nations and the city of Burnaby to boot. Frustrated by these delaying tactics, the Kinder Morgan Company sought and won a court injunction over the occupiers. Once it was enforced, no one except the survey workers were permitted to enter the injunction zone, which was marked by an expanding perimeter of yellow police tape. 
Over the course of the two-week standoff, 126 people violated the injunction and were arrested. During that time, concerned citizens, activists, and occupiers would daily congregate to protest and try to obstruct the work as much as possible. At the start of the period of injunction enforcement, clashes with the RCMP were much more frenzied, the arrests and treatment of young activists more violent, but a week later, they had taken on some characteristics of a photo op, respectable citizens lining up to register their civil disobedience, from professors to renowned environmentalists to grandmothers to the president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Rosalind Morris offers an absolutely brutal assessment of the contemporary Öffentlichkeit, or a concept of a public, and the politics of assembly that result from it. She characterizes it as a fundamentally specular politics, uh, in which self-exhibition takes place not in relation to those who resemble oneself, but in an expanding realm of anonymous receivers whose listening takes the form of overhearing and whose seeing consists in voyeurism. This is, in part, what happened on Burnaby Mountain during the standoff. But back to the sound. A couple of days after the first police crackdown and arrests, I slipped along a muddy ditch that had been trampled until you could barely walk over to a canvas tarp slung around a tree. The line of police was about 40 feet downhill from me. There were about 60 neon yellow vested cops and maybe 10 of them had video cameras trained on the known organizers. I picked my way through the mud to the makeshift tent, and out of the corner of my eye, I could see the black lens of the camera, like the round eye of a periscope, following me the entire way. Inside, a small huddle of activists, every now and then twitching aside the canvas to observe the police below. Beyond the police, some surveying equipment loaded onto trucks. Someone suggested that it might be possible to slip through a small gap in the police line and lock down to a truck. But almost the instant the words left his mouth, the police below, without consulting one another and responding to no audible command, flowed to fill the gap. That strip of canvas was bugged. Shortly afterward, two young people did manage to break through the police line, slipped bicycle U-locks around their necks, and locked themselves to the metal handles on a slab of concrete just on the other side of the yellow tape. This was not a piece of surveying equipment, it just happened to be behind the tape and was therefore a violation of the letter of the injunction. One of them slipped me the key to the lock as police descended on her. I beat a retreat into the crowd thinking that she would be less likely to be unlocked if the key were far away, but she gestured for me to come back closer so she wouldn't be stuck with a bicycle U-lock around her, her neck for longer than she could stand. In the meantime, the other activist, let's call him Z. Z's lock was cut away almost instantly. I have no idea how the police managed to break Z's U-lock so quickly, but all of a sudden, he was lifted up by several officers, and then he was no longer there. The RCMP had carried him to a small copse at the other end of the injunction zone. I left the key to the remaining lock with another activist and slunk along the police tape of my camera to where he was lying silently, face down on the ground, his hands zap-strapped behind him. A couple of other people followed me, one of them a professional videographer. We lay belly down on the ground, our cameras trained on Z. The audio I captured of this incident is not clear. I listened to it repeatedly in the months that followed, but not s I haven't since the USB port got damaged. <laughs> you can hear the sounds of the crowd, the wind, and over it all, the voice of a woman praying, to the person on the ground over there, we love you. I was filming as four police officers knelt by his prostrate form, presumably told him he was under arrest, then picked him up, one officer on each limb, and swiftly, silently, carried him to the back of a paddy wagon. Z's face was turned toward my camera, but the whole time he was lying on the ground, he stared expressionless and resolute into the middle distance. When I remember this moment, perhaps to compensate for Z's silence and the inaudibility of his arrest, I always think of the sound of Robert Jordan's heart beating against the pine needle floor of the forest as he awaits capture at the end of For Whom the Bell Tolls. This has all been very romantic, um, but there is another sound you can hear in my recording, over and above everything else, and perhaps this is the reason, the real reason, I haven't unearthed it for your audition. It is intolerable to me. In response to the praying woman calling out to Z's prone form, you can hear me yell, yeah, we love you, Zed, then, the whole world is watching. I mean, it was and it wasn't. 
but we were trapped inside the specular politics of assembly and the panopticon slash panacousticon. So while I wasn't saying anything untrue or even foolish, uh, the things I don't want you to hear in my voice, which it nonetheless betrays, are fear and impotence. What can we glean from sonorous events like this, even if they could be accessed, even if they could be heard? In the circumstance of making a last stand against future climate cataclysm, to think of sound as data, as we might once have done, misses the mark. Z's pointed silence, the limitations of my microphone, the resounding of a literary fragment projected onto a man as he was being arrested. Was this experience mine, suppressed along with the recording of my voice that betrayed my fear? Was it a memory? After all, was my heart too not beating against the forest floor? Was my overriding experience of my object of study in fact coming from inside of me? None of this is new. There are age-old anxieties about the vulnerability of the ear as a site that regulates difference inside and outside. Will Davies has argued, though, that the nervousness of our contemporary moment can be attributed to the gradual breakdown of Enlightenment-era distinctions between mind and body and war and peace, such that the vestiges of civilian life are now shot through with experiences of conflict reminiscent of war. This is not a recent development. Davies points to psychoanalysis and total war as precursors to so of social media, terrorism, and the climate catastrophe to come. But they all produce paranoid approaches to politics, whether expressed as anxiety over external forces pulling the strings, following Richard Hofstadter, an obsessive commitment to the hermeneutics of suspicion and close reading, following Eve kosofsky Skedgwick, or the collapse into each other of the categories of reason and feeling, which is the subject of Davies' book. But whenever we use language, we are thinking with other people's words. Our speech and our thoughts cannot escape thorough conditioning by the minds of others. The prospect produces paranoia, which is, in the words of Devorah Baum, a pathological form of intelligence. Readily triggered by anything that seems to confirm the suspicion that our minds may not be fully our own, that they did not come first. Recent accounts of the materiality of sound might lead us to suspect the same of our bodies and the world. Consider in this light Nina Sun Eidsheim's question. What if words and their sounds are supplements of something else, but not of an experience that awaits naming? Or another common move in sound studies that deploys close listening to illuminate some facet of social life. Peter Zendi points to a paradigm of auditory espionage that allows us better than any other to underst understand what is happening to us, even if the paradigm appears to be already a thing of the past. I don't want to point to a way out of paranoia. Uh, to do so, especially as a bypass mechanism, would be disingenuous. But the epigraph to Baum's chapter is taken, uh, or, or is by Kosofsky Sedgwick, and she says, paranoia seems to require to be imitated in order to be understood. Baum concludes her exploration of paranoia by pointing to Jacques Derrida's remarks immediately following 9-11. He said of the attacks, we do not know what we are talking about. As a singular embrace of doubt and the refusal to exercise the pathological intelligence that fixates on the idea that there is always something else behind this, through this, in this, and that it has to mean something. I'll conclude with some wisdom from an indigenous elder. In all seriousness, I'm half joking, but I, I want to, to caution against trying to escape paranoia by turning to the worldview of the other, uh, whoever that might be. Um, and also as something of a provocation, because sometimes I wonder what it is that we settlers want. And more to the point, um, how do we want it? Uh, what is the spirit in which we want it from indigenous critical theory? After all, if the paranoid style is uh, suspicious of the voice of the other which precedes us always, um, we do well to remember that it, is, it doesn't follow that there is an, uh, an originary voice. Anyway, a couple of years after all this went down, I was dealing with some fallout from like, various instances of lateral violence within the local radical environmentalist slash indigenous solidarity scene. I was trying to draft the template of an accountability process for a group of people in whom my trust had been completely broken. And I was writing in a bagel joint that no longer exists when an older gentleman started talking to me. His name is Woody Morrison, and he is a Haida elder who taught at Vancouver's Native Education Center. Um, after a while, I asked for his opinion on the whole accountability process undertaking, and he gave me, not theory, 
but some excellent adv and simple advice. <laughs> I think he could tell that I was obsessively fixated on it. So he said, sometimes it's best to look at problems from out of the corner of your eye instead of directly at it. The other thing he said to me was, in any group of people, you should take the IQ of the least intelligent person in the group and divide it by the number of people in that group, and that's the functional level of intelligence you're dealing with. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to start with a plug um, for a very late panel that I co-organized on the Iran uprising, uh, which is happening at 4 p.m. today um, in the Grand Salon B, Section 10, um, which is on the same floor. Is this mic, am I too hot on this mic? Okay. Okay, um, my, my, my paper is called Poco Disco, The Sonic Performativity of Grief, Grievance, and Joy in Diaspora. How does grief sound? How is it amplified? Is it communicable? Does it swirl around like a tornado pulling loose debris, housing, and uprooted trees into its cone? Like the sirens call seducing unwitting passersby, to incline into their decline? Does it resonate like a blue-noted fog of melancholy? Is grief a dance with loss whose choreography is learned balanced upon your mother's hip? Or is dance a grievance with time where no choreography can predict the next move? Wailing, sobbing, mourning, and burial songs are performances of grief that demarcate formalized dramaturgical events that emerge from crises, the sounds of which form a substantial part of the early anthropological, ethnomusicological, and performance studies archive on ritual. But how can, we, how can grief be audited outside of ritual confines when it has been displaced through processes of dispossession and psychic deferral, dispersed through diaspora, and circulated through global culture industries? How can audition be more than a witnessing, constituting as well a political and ethical call and response, a reckoning? As Arshia Haag, founder of Discostan, a Los Angeles-based, Southwest Asian, North Africa-focused music and culture club night has put it, quote, there's this shared atmosphere, this world called Samma, of listening and devotional experience that arises between the performer and listener. Listening is just as important an act as singing or making music. Sometimes people ask me if I make music and I'm like, no, I'm a listener, unquote. In the Sufi lineage with which Haq identifies, Samma is an auditory condition Post 9-11 diasporic convenings of what Haq refers to as the sonic ummah, a collectivity of Muslims convened in, convened in sound. I examine the performative enactments of grief into grievance in spaces I call the poco disco. So there's a lot of disco happening up here. <laughs> in pursuit of how grief is translated into culture, whether through a grievance made before the law or into other affects, feelings, and, and expressions, I consider diasporic melancholia as a condition that drives action, something that enacts change in the world something that can be world-making, something that is resonant with a thumping beat that you can dance to. I examine here how the poco disco stages an embodied and performative space of reckoning with diasporic melancholia, grief, and the performance of grievance. In what follows, I explore how diasporic melancholia is aestheticized, made audible, visible, and performed through dance, and how the private grief of melancholia is transferred into a publicly politicized grievance through performance. How can we understand such performative, public, world-making cultural productions, those ephemeral pop-up spaces that gather groups into colorful and loud displays of jubilation, 
amidst the dystopian circumstances that await dancers at the end of the night. I reckon here with what happens when, as Robert Warrior has put it, the intellectual chooses the dance as a site of knowledge production. Scene one. The crowd parts mid-dance to make way for Faluda Islam, who emerges from the middle of a tightly packed dance floor for the performance. A fast-paced number with dramatic drops to the floor, Bollywood eyes suicide dips, concluding with a mini strip tease. The sanctity of queerness, performance, and Islam was on display at the February 15th, 2019 Discostan held at the storied La Zona Rosa Bar in Los Angeles. Through Faluda Islam's zombie thriller interpretation of Helen's performance of Pia Tu Abdu Aja, Monica Oh My Darling, from Nasir Hussein's 1971 Bollywood classic film, Caravan. I, I, I'm not gonna show you the, the video, but it's, it's great. Mm -hmm. um, art, I, and, and by that I mean the actual uh, video of Caravan, because I don't have the video of, of uh, Fulu Islam, so. Artist uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who on this night performed as Faluda Islam, historicizes the character's development thus, quote, Faluda Islam is a Muslim bearded drag queen turned revolutionary from the middle of the 21st century, most likely from this world, per but per perhaps even another. Although she is a drag queen, her body is neither male nor female, not fully human, and one could say more extra than terrestrial. <laughs> Faluda is me. She was born, or perhaps resurrected, out of a creative need to express what I could not at a time when it was important for an artist of color who so happened to identify as queer and Muslim in the United States to find new ways to interrogate an ever more hostile, racist, and Islamophobic society." Unquote. Bhutto places his performance as Faluda Islam within an emerging creative movement he terms queer Muslim futurism, which he describes as, quote, a reclaiming of our stories. It points out problems and names our oppressors while at the same time creating space for healing. It's not idealistic. Every world we have created may be born of bloodshed, but it's what we do with those histories of bloodshed that provides the arc of each story." Unquote. A proscenium suddenly forms in the middle of the disco stand dance floor, making way for the performance of queer Muslim futurity. Disco Stan, the land of disco, the land of records, February 15th, 2019, with its large second floor loft space where numerous vendors formed a bazaar bustling with activity. Clothing by designer Hushi, homemade chat and sweets, rugs and hookahs, the bazaar was a theater of sensation with smells, textures, and colors, people haggling for deals and the general hubbub of a central market. Visuals projected onto a two-story wall behind the dance floor, a montage of the region's films and music videos from the 1950s through the 1990s. Shimmering sequin dancers sway while some gather around soloists engaged in flamboyant display. Hart's montage, montage extracts the centrally important component of film sound from the Bollywood genre, creating a club night and experience around it. Hal repurposes images and sounds from film and television in what she calls memory objects to stage events where subjects from, different, uh, from various backgrounds remember together. These are no one's memories in particular. They are collective memories by virtue of being a part of the region's commons. Sounds form an assemblage juxtaposed against a visual montage suturing together a re-memory for all. There is no master narrative, no hegemonic memory sequence. Instead, all become sutured through memory fragments in what she calls a sonic umma. Quote, Discostan was the imaginary republic that was like my homeland, unquote. The name arose for Hag in 2011 after a lifetime of collecting. Discostan was the name given to her intimate collection of sounds. Collecting the sounds of home became a means of reconciling the predicament of being neither here nor there. 
Audio became a tapestry for creating a homeland, her sonic performative. On September 10th, 2001, Hawk moved to Valencia, California to begin an MFA in film, coinciding her film training with the rise in Islamophobia that resulted from the events of the following day. Hawk was determined to reveal how her art is, as she puts it, quote, rooted in an early place of Islamic epistemology because there's such a strong emphasis on not having anthropomorphic representation and the danger of that and the danger of individuality. Informed by the teachings of early 20th century Sufi mystic Hazrat Inayat Khan, sound practices for her a spiritual practice in search of transcendence. The exile, the diaspora, and the queer, the feminist, identity markers that index the original trauma of displacement, dispossession, and or invisibility. These are figures who often exist outside of the strict and formal settings, as Haq has put it, which give rise to ri ritual traditions. This outsider status undermines the subject's sense of entitlement to the cultural patrimony that binds communities together. And I use patrimony on purpose there. As Jafari Allen has put it, quote, what if we think of a queer, I'm sorry, what if we think of queer as precisely not about individualism and moving outside, but as a continual dynamic project of constituting a collection of interstitial outsider perspectives, unquote. The Poco Disco plays to the crowd, organized at once around the cosmopolitan multiple personalities of the diasporic subject, while tugging on the heartstrings of local and regional identities. Global hits are heard in between regional classics, and this varied playlist brings with it changes to the dance floor in bodies and dance styles. One of the great joys of Discostan is to play a full quote, I'm sorry, quote, one of the great joys of Discostan is to play a full gawali and hold the dance floor and then have the next that have that next to something that might have been produced in Cairo in 2019. There's new meaning created when you put things next to each other, unquote. This is hot. You run to the dance floor when you hear your favorites and counting friends and strangers. Through colloquial affectations like flicks, twirls, snaps of the wrists, fingers, hips, what Karim Kupchandani refers to as ishtail, you recognize yourself, your auntie, your dad, or other familiars in the various dance personalities on display. A sense of exhilaration emerges from the public performance of these once cloistered gestures. To be seen dancing, felt shoulder to shoulder by strangers, and to hear in public what, what, what was once relegated to the safety of the immigrant enclave allows for a momentary experience of a utopian fantasy where the public and private merge. The song changes to a different patois, revealing a different dance vocabulary articulated by a new troupe of dancers. You politely make way as you revel in the intricacies of their embodied repertoire. The Poco Disco stages a sonic performative, an improvisatory becoming on the part of the attendees who encounter themselves and others dynamically in sound, including music from various origins, some instrumental and some lyrical, sung in a multitude of languages and dialects with which a majority of listeners, dancers, and, and, and attendees are unfamiliar. The juxtaposition of a diverse array of songs brings different audiences together back to back on the dance floor, which becomes a site of encounter for attendees who experience through dance floor and dance form cohabitation, new senses of becoming. The interruption to the semantic and narrative flow of each performance tradition could on the one hand be experienced as cacophonous, but is experienced otherwise as dance repertoires coexist, even if momentarily on the dance floor. Movement continues even if narrative logic is gone. The sonic performative enacts through the G DJ's juxtaposition of national, regional, linguistic, and stylistic difference, and through the embodied transmission of sound into movement, a sense of belonging otherwise. The Poco Disco is a venue for the performance of diasporic melancholia by outsider figures who in various ways misuse abuse and confuse orthodoxy, enacting a world making that rethinks and challenges while also honoring tradition. 
Diasporans, including the descendants of slaves, migrants, refugees, exiles, and the landless, notoriously occupy a precarious relationship to histories of belonging. Marginalized, displaced, or dispossessed of their title to citizenship, they hover in various interstices between nations, cultures, laws, languages, and or natal communities. I need a drink of water, excuse me. Diasporic melancholia is the condition of alienation, isolation, loss, and privation experienced as a result of dispossession and displacement. This dispossession and displacement remainders trauma, grief, and often melancholic attachments to lost homelands. As Sarah Clark Kaplan has theorized it, the notion of diasporic melancholia is an effort to, quote, understand melancholia not as a private, backward-looking phenomenon of paralyzing psychic conflict, but as an embodied individual and collective psychic practice with the political potential to transform grief into the artic articulation of grievances that traverse continents and cross time, unquote. Diasporic melancholia is a condition that can be categorized under the umbrella term postcolonial melancholia, uh, which is the title of a, a 2005 uh, Paul Gilroy publication. I engage melancholia in the, in the way that David Ang and Shin Hee Han have defined it as, quote, a structure of everyday group experience for Asian Americans as a depathologized structure of feeling, unquote. This is a structure of feeling that leaves the formerly colonized diasporic subject with a sense of loss. What exactly is experienced as loss? The loss of homeland, the loss of potential held by post-colonial revolutions, the loss of uplift promised by the paternalism of the colonizer is ambiguous and potentially variable for all. Regardless, as Anne Chang, David Eng, and David Kasanjian have suggested, it is worth considering post-colonial melancholia as a condition faced by the formerly colonized, and more so, worth exploring how this condition is similar to or different from what has been theorized as racial melancholia. Melancholia originates for Freud as a pathological failed grief that produces a subject who refuses to let go of the lost object, becoming a subject of that grief. Indeed, the loss of homeland as love object the condition of coloniality was, in Freud's original definition of both mourning and melancholia, quote, mourning is regularly the reaction to the loss of a loved person or to the loss of some abstraction which has taken the place of one, such as one's country, liberty, an ideal, and so on. In some people, the same influences produce melancholia instead of mourning, and we consequently suspect them of a pathological disposition. This is uh, from his uh, Mourning and Melancholia, 1918. The egoic and libidinal attachments to one's country forms one of the bases of the condition for Freud. Numerous scholars have made important correlations between race and melancholia structured on this very essay. This prior work has tended to focus primarily on depression as the affect ailing the melancholic racialized subject. But depression is not the only way diasporic or po postcolonial melancholia can be felt. Freud makes an important connection between melancholia and mania, proposing something along the lines of a spectrum on which opposing extremes offer the subject of loss various possibilities for feeling, affect, expression, and action. He writes, quote, the content of mania is no different from that of melancholia, that both disorders are wrestling with the same complex, but that probably in melancholia the ego has succumbed to the complex, wherein, whereas in mania it has mastered or pushed it aside." Unquote. In its original coinage, melancholia was a diagnosis for the loss suffered by the post-colonial uh, colonial subject, a condition contained with a co within a complex of disorders that includes mania. Freud theorized the loss suffered by the displaced and dispossessed as potentially taking the form of both depression and jubilation. Most scholars engaging his original essay have tended to emphasize the negative affects of melancholia, like depression, insomnia, or eating disorders, even if noting their pleasures. Ignoring the discussion of mania, which Freud recognized as equally available as an expression to the subject of loss. 
I consider how the Poco Disco is a site of queer postcolonial cultural production and performance in which mania, which Freud indexes through joy, exultation, and triumph, can be a mechanism for the expression of and reckoning with loss alongside melancholia. Characterized by euphoria, hyperactivity, arousal, and reduced need for sleep, the dance club harnesses manic desire. Set to the sounds of pop, rock, funk, disco, and electro with Hindi, Farsi, Urdu, Arabic, and Turkish lyrics, the Poco Disco sounds political through the mere rejection of a colonial lingua franca, making it a, a space for, as Kaplan has put it, quote, collective psychic practice with the political potential to transform grief into the articulation of grievances. The Poco Disco emerges at, at that intersection where grievance encounters jubilation, which can sound like Afrobeat and Bollywood, Desilicious and 1002 Nights, after our stagings of the multi-sensory, pan-ethnic, pan-sexual space-time of diasporans. Cosmopolitical and post-colonial worlds, from Lahore to Johannesburg, from London to Toronto, coalesce at these discos where attendees come in search of immersive forays into ancestral leisure time, donned in maximalist saris, dashikis, sequins, and bejeweled headdresses. The Poco Disco aestheticizes diasporic melancholia, making it audible, visible, and embodied. Poco Discos amplify grief and act as stages for grievance through the regionally specific, yet multilingual and pan-ethnic sounds connecting various times and places to fantastical uh, dreamland of a sonic post-colonial future. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, we have a decent amount of time for questions, comments, conversations, that sort of thing. Um, if no one has anything ready to go, I sure do. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'll just begin then. Uh, so first of all, thank all of you so much uh, for this incredible, like really great research and really wide ranging research. I had some questions really for all of you through this framework of, you could think about it, I guess, as occupation, or maybe spatial entitlement, to borrow from Gay Teresa Johnson, just this idea that people in a place that group is. I was just wondering if you could all respond to that, because I hear kind of bits of that um, in everyone's talk. That. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I. Yeah, because I, I invoked her specifically. Uh, I believe that term. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great book. It's a great uh, sort of notion. Um, I think w one of the ways that um, you know, I'm dealing with urban space, specifically as she does too, in terms of LA, right? So, so there's that kind of uh, connection there, I suppose. But I, I think. Um, whether it's her terminology or other kind of analytics that everybody brought up, I, I do think that one way in, in which we think about or have tried to think about it together is by invoking this notion of amplify, which I think everybody was kind of working with in some capacity, um, which just had conversations about this, whether it's the literal, you know, turning up a volume, but also of kind of social visibility, right? And so for, you know, Teresa Johnson, she thinks of in some ways about spatial entitlement in that way, right? It's this sort of sound making, these sort of sonic kinds of um, solidarities with other people, black, brown communities, and how that sort of creates a kind of this ethos of spatial entitlement. For me in Chicago, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it, it's just an interesting situation where you have, you know, as an immigrant city, and particularly, you know, Latinx is Latinos having a robust history there. And yet, <laughs> you know, I think in the broader kind of racial imaginary, we don't think about Chicago that way. Yep. And, okay, so my question is like, well, why not? You know, um, I mean, it's only the second largest ethnic Mexican population in the United States. 
and yet we don't think about it that way. Even me, you know, doing ethnic studies, Mexican American studies, Latino studies, like you know, in my training, and getting to Chicago, uh, that was a problem. That like, how could I have been sort of engaged in this work, and yet I arrive at a place and don't already have that sort of sense about it. And so that just made me curious, like, why does that, to extend the sonic metaphor, that silence exist? Um, and so, um, and I think, thankfully, engaging with my colleagues who work here to think, up, you know, about sound in this way, is, um, and, and other scholars, like, like you mentioned, like, it's helped me try to understand that, I guess, for myself, but then writing through it in a way. So, but yeah, but I don't know. Can we just go down? Is that all right? Okay. Yeah, I think um, uh, um, I, I, I think I don't think about <laughs> uh, marching bands in, in Mardi Gras parades as, as a form of, of occupation or some type of incursion into um, a spatial entitlement. Um, I think, but but I think it's because it's it's of the nature of the sort of you know quote unquote object of of study, right? Sure. I think um, you know. I, I, I'm an anthropologist, and, and so my work on, on other forms of assembly in New Orleans, I think, would align. And I'm thinking of second line parades and jazz funerals and, you know, essentially like um, a, a, a kind of sonic and embodied uh, claim that's being made on um, uh, n not necessarily white spaces, because this is obviously a black city, but um, and, and meaning it's a you know, 60 to 70 percent majority black city. But, um, but, but in terms of spaces that uh, uh, the bilk ar architecture of which has the imprint of, you know, a white supremacist, mm -hmm. um, and, and but I think that the, th uh, in, and so why why I say you know quote unquote as an anthropologist, um, what I mean is, I work with this marching band community as essentially like a volunteer, right? I helped. Um, the, the founder of, of the Roots of Music, Derek Tab, approached me for help to start the organization in 2007, and so I come to this um, uh, uh, sort of um, formation, you know, this sort of social formation as somebody who's there as an advocate. And, and in other words, I think um, a, lo a lot of the work in American studies that's, that's very powerful to me, but, but, but comes out of a different perspective, is that um, there's a certain um, a, a political um, claim or, or point that's being searched for, for instance, say like in an Afrofuturism or, or a type of, um, of politics of, of radical transformation, uh, um, uh, the black radical tradition, you know, I think I made a quip that like this is not that, right? Yeah. Th th this, this is something, uh, a, a world that I enter into um, and, it, and, and it has its own sort of set of rules and codes and, and a lot of those rules and codes are built around politics of, of black respectability that have been the only effective um, conduit through which uh, the, the, um, the, the political and, and social and, and structural um, uh, 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 top-down um, conditions of possibility, to use the term again, have been kind of cracked, right? Yeah. And so, so that's how I'd, I'd answer that without elaborating and taking up all the time. <laughs> Um, thanks. It's a really great question, um, and uh, something that I'm kind of. A, that's. Oh yes, good good point. Okay, <laughs> it was like really <laughs> ominous. Um, uh, something that I'm, uh, uh, you know, like I excited to talk about um, at some length, but hopefully it won't come to that. Um, so I think um, one of the things that uh, you said in your question was like the, the 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 occupation of public space is seen by the sort of dominant group as some sort of incursion, um, and I think like this is this is one of the things that um, the Rosalind Morris paper that I was uh, citing, which I feel like I'm blanking on the title right now, but Matt pointed me towards it, and um, it's something like theses on the contemporary Öffentlichkeit, something like that, like you, you would never <laughs> type it into a Google. <laughs> um, but it's brilliant. Um, but she's writing about um, <laughs> a number of um, uh, sort of recent um, 
occupations of public space, including Occupy Wall Street, sort of um, the Gezi Park occupations. I think, um, if I remember correctly, oh, oh my gosh, yeah, the, the start of the Arab Spring is like a big, a huge part of it. Um, and um, but one of the things that she that she points out is that um, there, you know, because of the mediatized nature of 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 um, sort of. I, I, you know what we think of as like viral occupations or like the the ways that we we get crowds out it's all sort of filtered through um, this like specular politics essentially um, which sort of always puts the eye of the um, of the of the of of power really as as sort of the central concern um, now there are of course occupying movements including a lot of the indigenous movements in British Columbia where I was working where actually it's not about what you're seen to be doing it's about actually like we own the title to this land and we're gonna we're not getting out of the way <laughs> and we're gonna like if you don't want to build this pipeline or if you want to build this pipeline we're not going to move um, which is I think not quite the same thing um, because it's not sort of filtered through that specular thing. That said, in those situations, in a lot of the cases, the 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 the, the sheer sort of force of the military ends up getting brought down on it. So, um, I mean, I, I, that's not very optimistic, but I do. Th but um, but I really appreciate the question because I think that that distinction is a very important one. I guess. I'll just quickly say um, this is a, an underground phenomenon. So um, I would have to think about how occupation works in a kind of subterranean mm -hmm. context. So I'm not sure about that. But, but if you can say, say that what's so generative, I think, about your work is the, is the public private that, that you're kind of working, right? And, and the notions of belonging, so and so, yeah, it is interesting. You, you, that your paper made me was making me think about that, so I just wanted to interject and say I do see something there. Yeah. Meaning, meaning, um, you're kind of playing with what is, what is the public sphere and what is the private sphere in your paper, and so the, so the notion of, of the fact that there's a um, you know an intimacy and a shared melancholia and a sense of belonging in this, the, the notion of whether that's contained in, you know, is it a public space, is it a private space? I feel like your work kind of pro proactively. That was kind of part of my question, what was behind it was also this idea of like, who is supposed to be where and how are they supposed to act and sound when they're in that space? Um, and like when do we interpret it as noise versus when do we interpret it as sound? So like if we're saying noise, we might be thinking more about I, I think that the people doing that work and curating those dance floors are, are disentangling that. Be by the kind of music they curate, I think also by how open they are about actually really pushing against these ready-made ideas about Latinidad, about Mexicanness, about all that stuff. I mean, one of the, uh, Itzinala had said this wonderful thing once to me. He was like, man, it's like when I'm DJing, it's like I'm trying to figure out who I am you know, through that process. And I think that ethos does, uh, in a way, permeate a lot of what people are doing. And, you know, and I, 
Yeah, I mean, when, when you're in those spaces and you get a sense of what people are doing, I think they, yeah, they're definitely grappling with that, but I, I think they're, on the one hand, I think doing so just as, I think, music appreciators, right, and people who are just open, right, to music and culture, right? Uh, but I think on the other hand, too, you know, I invoke Leo Chavez, I think there's that singularity of what Latino is that is, you know, in terms of a kind of mon monolithic, monocultural sort of thing, right, which is appropriated in the kind of a discourse of a certain kind of ilk, right, that then justifies really punitive approaches to immigrants, to Latinos more broadly, and that's kind of very monolithic, and I think one of the things that people tend to be doing as they're trying to figure it out is like, you know, how to highlight how this is a, a multi-ethnic, multi-racial sort of context of listening, of music, of all the rest. And the people who participate, you know, very different kind of backgrounds and situations. So, I mean, that's what I've observed. And I, um, so I, I think they, 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 they kind of themselves disentangle or, or disarticulate, you know, those, those problems, those um, tropes and ideas that, that uh, oftentimes their own communities get burdened with, right? So that's what I, w I would answer that. Yeah, well, I think um, <laughs> I I once asked a friend who's a smarter Marxist than me, like, w w w you know, <laughs> yes, <laughs> what what is um, you know if if you were to do a, a sort of Marxist um, uh, analysis of a charter school, like, who is the capitalist and who is the consumer and who is the the um, what is the product, right? Um, be because it, it doesn't. And, and it, Thomas's answer was, um, yeah, Marx wasn't thinking about a capital school when he wrote, um, you know, about capital. I mean, wasn't thinking of a charter school when he wrote about capital. Sorry, um, man, I ruined the punchline. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but you know, one way to think about the the child is as a commodity, right? I mean, it's horrifying, right? The notion that um, what, what Bettina Love, you know, calls dark children be because she's talking about people of color and students of color in various educational settings, right? Um, but, in, but in New Orleans, it's predominantly um, black children as um, literal, like, widgets that are, that are bought and sold by um, uh, uh, a charter school is essentially, you know, they they're, it, they cloak themselves as nonprofits b because they have to, um, but but they're not, right? They're they're huge money making organizations, and they work in tandem with a massive form of public education where, you know, textbooks and tests and and desks and buildings and everything else. Um, you know, is I mean, when Milton Friedman envisioned neoliberalism, he, he focused on public education because it, it's the largest possible um, market, right? You, everyone has to go through it. Uh, it won't, you know, for for a, a long period of their lives. So all that to say that um, you know, my answer from here on will be very short, which is that I think, um, in a disconcerting way, we have to ask ourselves. Um, you know, where are, wh wh where does a, a capitalist see value in blackness and, and, and music and a certain type of performative presentation of self or student body, right? Um, and, and so again, when I started this research in 2007, what we were seeing is that 
Um, uh, uh, the charter school model is essentially a teach to the test model because their accountability as a school is based on how their students do in scores, which are of course math and English subjects. So we're seeing this huge lop off of what education scholars call an access gap, meaning these kids don't have access to arts education. And that, that's basically still true except for band. And so band is the one aspect of arts education that has really ticked up over time. There's some I have great local colleagues that are studying that and I'm using you know, that l literal quantitative data of, of New Orleans and that's basically what it shows. De definitely. I mean, I, I would say a couple of things. Is one, there's, um, there, there is a, a, a very strong presence of girls in marching band, and, and they span kind of like every form of, you know, gender and sexual identity, right? Um, uh, uh, but but th to get to the heart of your question, I, th I think immediately of this, um, the, the one current woman band director in New Orleans is Asia Muhaymin at uh, Warren Easton High School, and she, um, you know, essentially has heard a lot of, of you know, clapback. Um, uh, you know, a common, uh, and again, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not just uh, a pointing finger at the marching band community, I'm just kind of presenting, the, again, the conditions of possibility for that scene, which is, you hear a lot, very commonly, like, uh, you know, oh, your band sounds like a bunch of girls, Right, that would be like a very common kind of diss, right, um, of a you know mixed gender band, and she works very hard to um, have girls represented in every section. So one of the things I talked about was the way instruments are gendered. Kyle DeCosta has written a great study on that, and, and a brass band in New Orleans. But but talking about marching band and kids. Um, you know, essentially, like one of the things about Asia is, sh you know, she's pl not just playing any instrument. Like to come out on a mellophone is is making a statement. To come out on a tuba is making a statement. So Asia um, will, you know, think about uh, uh, w essentially like uh, uh, what often happens is a band director will assign you an instrument based on your body size, and she's more likely to ask the student what instrument they want to play, and then you know work out the math of how that forms a band that keep. All right, well, let's thank our wonderful panelists for a very engaging talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just, yeah, I just feel lucky that, that you asked me to do this, Matt, so <laughs> thanks.